Okay, we are in the final session of our review of the book of Ezekiel. And we are going to explore chapters 46 through 48. And of course, we're dealing here with the millennium. Uh, last time, we had three chapters. We talked, in chapter 43, we had the future sanctuary, the temple. We went through some of the sacrifices that they're going to be observing, some of the other regulations. The first chapter tonight is really a carryover from that, that series. It, in a sense, it, it, uh, if, the, if we didn't run out of time, we would have shoehorned chapter 46 into that one. Last time, you may recall, we talked about the Holy District, 25,000 cubits on a side, temple there in the middle uh, uh, path there. Um, uh, 10,000 uh, cubits is about 8.3 miles, to give you a feeling. So this is uh, about, um, or excuse me, uh, 25,000 cubits is 8.3 miles. And uh, we have the, uh, the middle portion there where the temple is, is also where the living quarters for the sons of Zadok, the priesthood would be. The Levites themselves, who have a different set of, different set of responsibilities, you may recall, anyway have that top swath. The bottom one has the city of Jerusalem, and each side of which are land areas for growing produce to feed. So that's the holy district itself. We're going to actually see the whole geography here later in, in the subsequent chapters here. But uh, we have a portion for the prince, this mysterious figure. That's not the Messiah. It's not King David. It's yet a, a, some, uh, a principle uh, for the, the uh, keeping things orderly here. So t we now are going to go through chapter 46 with some supplementary orders that really, in a sense, are carry over from last time. It's going to include regulations for the Sabbath and the new moon sacrifices, and then the conduct and offerings of the people in the temple. Not talking about the Levites and the priests, talking about the people themselves in the temple. In the, in, in the, then we'll get into chapter 47, which talks about this river, very strange river, and then 48 where they allocate the land, and that will wrap up our review of this third section of Ezekiel, from 40 to 48, where we're dealing with this. So let's just jump right in. Ezekiel 46, verse 1, Thus saith the Lord God, The gate of the inner court that looketh toward the east shall be shut the six working days. But on the Sabbath it shall be opened, and in the day of the new moon it shall be opened. The inner court is opened only on Shabbat, on Saturday, and it's closed the other work days. That includes Sunday. And it will also be open on the new moon. Very Jewish thing going on here. This is a very Jewish situation we're looking at here. And uh, these people that feel that the Sunday is our Sabbath are mixing metaphors. The Sabbath is the Sabbath. It's distinctive. And uh, so it's on the Sabbath that the temple will be opened and on the new moon. Going on. And the prince shall enter by the way of the porch of that gate without, and shall stand by the post of the gate, and the priest shall prepare his burnt offering and his peace offerings, and he shall worship at the threshold of the gate. Then he shall go forth, but the gate shall uh, not be shut until evening. There's no entrance to the temple on the west, and the east gate is permanently shut, because that's the one the Lord uses, okay? We got that in chapter 44 last time. Likewise, the people of the land shall worship at the door of this gate before the Lord in the Sabbaths and the new moons. And the burnt offering that the prince shall offer unto the Lord, that's why you know he's not the Messiah, he's offered the Lord, on the, in the Sabbath day shall be six lambs without blemish and a ram without blemish. The offerings here are slightly enlarged in contrast to the Torah parallels, by the way. And the meat offering shall be an ephah for a ram, and a meat offering for the lambs as he shall be able to give, and a hin of oil to an ephah. And in the day of the new moon it shall be a young bullock without blemish, and six lambs and a ram, and they shall be without blemish. The offering's reduced a bit for the new moon, interestingly enough. There's a number of, when you, if you take the trouble to really parallel what's going on here versus the teaching of the Torah, there's differences, and those distinctives were very disturbing to those from a Levitical background. It almost didn't make, the, as you know, it almost didn't, Ezekiel almost didn't make it in the canon because of those differences. Continuing, he shall prepare a meat offering, and an ephah for a bullock, and an ephah for a ram, and the lambs, according as his hand shall attain unto, and a hin of oil uh, to an ephah. And when the prince shall enter, he shall go in by the way of the porch of that gate, and he shall go forth by the way thereof. But when the people of the land shall come before the Lord in the solemn feasts, he that entereth in by the way of the north gate to worship shall go out by the way of the south gate. 
And he that entereth by the way of the south gate shall, shall go forth by the way of the north gate. He shall not return by the way of the gate whereby he came in, but shall go forth over against it. Very strange. Very, very strange. But implies that there's pre-designated routes for the worshipers. But that's, that's the way it is. And the prince in the midst of them, when they go in, shall go in, and when they go forth, shall go forth. And in the feasts and the solemnities, the solemnities of the, the meat offering uh, shall be an ephah to a bullock and an ephah to a ram and the lambs as he is able to give and a hen of oil to an ephah. Now when the prince shall prepare a voluntary burnt offering or peace offerings voluntarily unto the Lord, one shall then open him the gate that looketh toward the east and he shall prepare his burnt offering and his peace offerings as he did on the Sabbath day. Then he shall go forth and after his going forth, one shall shut the gate." Thou shalt daily prepare a burnt offering unto the Lord of the Lamb of the first year without blemish. Thou shalt prepare it every morning. Now what's strange about this, if you're following this, it's talking about morning but not evening. Thou shalt prepare a meat offering for it every morning, the sixth part of the ephah, the third part of a hint of oil, to temper with a fine flour, a meat offering, and continually by a perpetual ordinance unto the Lord. They shall prepare the lamb and the meat offering and the oil every morning for a continual burnt offering. Every morning. What's conspicuous to a careful student is that the evening sacrifices aren't mentioned. Now, some scholars wonder if that really means anything. Possibly they're just implied, maybe not. So that's a, there's a big debate among the th uh, scholars as to whether their omission is somehow significant. And, and that's unresolved, in my mind at least. Thus saith the Lord God, if the prince give a gift to any of his sons. Now see, these, this prince has sons. So that argues that the prince isn't King David. He's some other kind of uh, dignitary, uh, a key personage here. Anyway, if the prince give a gift to any of his sons, the inheritance thereof shall be his sons. It shall be their possession by inheritance. In other words, if a son from the prince gets property, he gets to keep it, in contrast to what we're going to see in a minute. The prince that has sons can inherit, and we're talking about the year of the Jubilee, will be in force. If the prince shall give any part of his state to one of his sons, it will also belong to his descendants, that is the son's descendants. Property given to a family member will not be returned in the year of Jubilee is the point. But if he give a gift of his inheritance to one of his servants, then it shall be his to the year of liberty, that is to the year of Jubilee. After it shall return to the prince, but his inheritance shall be his sons for them. To the year of liberty, we, uh, most authorities take for granted that that's a reference to what they call the, the year of Jubilee. And uh, a gift to a servant will not be permanent then. It expires at the Jubilee, which is the, uh, that was the intention broadly in the Torah, actually. Moreover, the prince shall not take of the people's inheritance by oppression to thrust them out of their possession, but he shall give his son's inheritance out of his own possession, that by people be not scattered every man from his possession. No vineyard of Naboth situations here, for example. The regulation shows that no individual will gain permanent control of the land, is the idea. And after he brought me through the entry, which was at the side of the gate, Ezekiel talking, into the holy chambers of the priest, which looked toward the north, and behold, there was a place on the two sides westward. Now here's a picture, you may recall when we looked through this. You had priest's chambers on either side of the, the naos, the temple proper, and then you had kitchens for the priests in those corners. And now, as you go further, you had, of course, the inner gates, and then you added the outer gates. You may recall when we were building this earlier. And so, and you had the chambers in the outer court. But then you also had outer gates, and, and it's going to talk about this here in a minute. Then said he unto me, This is the place where the priest shall boil the trespass offerings and the sin offerings, where they shall bake the meat offerings, and they shall bear them not out into the utter court to sanctify the people. Then he brought me forth into, into the utter court and caused me to pass by the four corners of the court. And behold, in every corner of the court there was a court. And in the four corners of the court there were courts joined of 40 cubits long and 30 broad. And these four corners were of one measure. And there was a row of building round about in them, round about them in four. It was made with boiling places under the rows round about. And he said unto me, These are the places of them that boil, where the ministers of the house shall boil the sacrifice of the people. Now it's interesting that no wine is mentioned. And uh, 
It's also interesting that they have a lunar calendar introduced in all this, which implies some astronomical issues. But in any case, the people's kitchens are, the, the, the priest's kitchens were inside the inner court. The people's kitchens are the four corners of the outer court. And uh, that's what he's dealing with there. Now we get to chapter 47, and we deal with this river. There are people that take this river allegorically, a river of blessing. They take it as a symbol. But I think you'll have to agree the language doesn't really allow that. It's a literal river. It's a literal, life-giving river. It has all kinds of details that are going to be included as we go through here. There are fishermen that deal in this river. There are salty swamps and marshals at the, at the periphery. Joel even mentions that this river, uh, he mentioned this before Ezekiel's time, back in Joel chapter 3, verse 18. Zechariah speaks of this and gives us some detail that Ezekiel misses. Um, yeah, that was after the Babylonian captivity is finished. So let's take a look at this. Afterward, he brought me again into the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house, house being the temple, right? Uh, eastward. And uh, for the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under, uh, under from the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. So we have the temple, and we have that the, you're going to discover that river goes to Jerusalem and then splits into two, flowing to the Mediterranean westward and to the Dead Sea eastward and then southward. Okay? They then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward and led me about the way without unto the utter gate by the way that looketh eastward, and behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And uh, Zechariah in his writings records that the water flowed from Jer that flowing from Jerusalem will divide with half going eastward to the Dead Sea and the other half flowing west toward the Mediterranean. Ezekiel only sees the one side, but Zechariah uh, sees both, it turns out. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits and brought me through the waters, and the waters were to the ankles. Understand what's happening. The further he goes, the deeper it gets. The first thousand cubits, cubits about a foot and a half for our purposes, uh, it's only ankle deep. You could walk across it, presumably. And again, he measured a thousand cubits, that is, and brought me through the waters, and the waters were to the knees. And again, he measured a thousand and brought me through, and the waters were to the loins. And we measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen, waters to swim in a river that could not be passed over. Now, you can form your own conclusions, but I think it's a stretch to say that this is just an allegory of rivers of blessing. This to me sounds like a river that's wet, that you can wade in, you can swim in, that it gets deeper the further downstream you go. So, you know, Ezekiel's brought from the outer court to the vestibule of the temple. There he sees this stream uh, passing south of the altar and southeastern gate. At a thousand, it's ankle deep. Another thousand, and within four thousand cubits, we have a river that's deep enough to swim in. In these first few verses, so it's a real river. Now, one of the things to get across here, you know, we as uh, from our point of view, we read a lot about all these details with the offerings and and and, and we don't really, unless you're really going to study, it, you don't follow which kind of offering for which purpose. But you understand, this is a message that Ezekiel is giving. Uh, those that are still captives in Babylon. He's, 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 he's pointed out to them that God is going to restore Israel. But as, as, as through uh, Ezekiel, God describes these detail, that, that of course means they're real, but they also understand it's a form of encouragement to those people. It gives these, this, this uh, message of Ezekiel substance that rattles when you shake it, so to speak, because it's not just a temple as an abstract. They've got the square footage and the entrances and the steps, and you know, it, it makes it real. Is the point? That's an encouragement to Ezekiel's readers. Now, from our point of view, where we're sitting, it's intriguing because it also does the same thing for us. It means that this kingdom that's coming is tangible. It's on the earth. It's not some fuzzy, fuzzy up in heaven kind of thing. It's here on the earth, and it's really going to be established this way. Continuing, verse 6, And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? And then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. 
Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river there were many trees on the one side and on the other. That's what you usually do see when you have a river, right? There's growth on both sides. And he said to me, These waters issue out toward the east country and go down into the desert and into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the water shall be healed. It's so going down the Arabah, down the Jordan, in effect, reaching to the Gulf of Aqaba, ultimately, transforming it, making the waters of the, what is now called the Dead Sea fresh, it teeming with life, like the Mediterranean Sea. That's going to be in verses 8, 9, and 10 here. The Dead Sea is six times saltier than the ocean. It's a very, when we go, when you visit there, you, that's one of the things you like to do if you've never done it before, when you go down to the Dead Sea, is to go out in the water. It's a weird feeling. Because you more than float, you're, on, you're not exactly walking on it, but you almost are. You want to be careful you don't get any in your eyes, and you certainly don't drink it. But it's bizarre. It's an interesting experience, a very strange experience, very oily, very uh, something everybody wants to do at least once. And uh, so, and it's come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither. For they shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river cometh. So, it's the, it's the, the Dead Sea, which is now six times saltier than the ocean, is going to become salt-free. Not the borders, by the way. Interesting. So, I'm past that the fishers shall stand upon it from the Engedi, even to uh, en Eglain, and they will, uh, it shall be a place to spread their nets, and the fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea, exceeding many. And Glenn, we're not sure where that is, by the way. The uh, 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 authorities, it me technically the word means the spring of two calves, but the, wh where it actually located is uncertain. Maybe on the southwestern shore of the Dead Sea, near Zor, or maybe on the northwest near Kerbert Qumran, but that, that's, those are speculations. But the miry places thereof, and the marshes thereof, shall not be healed, they shall be given to salt. Interestingly enough. And by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all the trees for meat, or food actually, whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their, their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for, uh, for meat or for food, and the leaf thereof for medicine. Interesting. Doesn't that echo... You know, uh, the other passages in the New Testament. And there's a whole bunch of them. Revelation 22 deals with the same thing, of course, all through uh, Joel 3, Zechariah 13, and so on. So again, we have the waters coming down to Jerusalem and then splitting to the Mediterranean or to the Dead Sea. Thus saith the Lord God, this shall be the border whereby ye shall inherit the land according to the twelve tribes of Israel. So now we're going we're, we're gonna to start partitioning things here. Joseph shall have two portions. Why does he have two portions? Because he acceded to the rights of the firstborn. Reuben blew it, fell on Joseph, so he's, he's in the position of the firstborn, which means he gets a double portion. Now the north and south boundaries are going to span about 280 miles that we're going to deal with here. They're going to be in bands, essentially horizontally, or east and west, if you will. And Joseph's going to have two portions. And that's according to the original promise of Jacob back in Genesis 48, verse 5 and verse 22 back there. Joseph's sons were given the birthright because Reuben forfeited his birthright because he was messing around with his father's concubines. So he, let, he, li he lives in infamy ever since. And ye shall inherit one as, well, one as well as the other, concerning the which I have lifted up mine hand to give it to your fathers, and this land shall fall unto you for inheritance." I lifted up mine hand, he says. That's a posture of swearing an oath. And you'll find that all through the scripture, lifting up the hand is usually associated with swearing an oath. And when God swears an oath, that means he's not going to change his mind. Big deal, by the way. You will not understand the epistle to the Hebrews unless you really understand that swearing an oath means that that's beyond change of any kind. Well, now we have the land covenant in, right, in operation here. God promised Abraham and his descendants the land of Palestine back in Genesis 13 and 15. And that promise has never been rescinded. It's being attacked by the world today, very broadly, and uh, even by the United States, strangely. Israel's, ex is, uh, Israel's experiencing blessing in the land was conditioned 
upon her obedience. That is, experiencing her blessing was conditioned upon obedience, not her right to possess it. Her right to possess the land was never been revoked. That's Deuteronomy 28 and elsewhere. When God inaugurates His new covenant with Israel in the future, she will be restored to her place of blessing in the land. And that's what Ezekiel 36 and 37 was all about, as you may recall. To prepare the people for this new occupation, God defined the boundaries of the country, and they're a little different than you'd expect. Israel's borders during the millennium will be similar to those promised her during the time of Moses in Numbers 34. Let's just jump in, verse 15 of Ezekiel 47. And this shall be the border of the land toward the north side, from the great sea, the way of Hethlon, as men go to Zedad. Now Zedad was the northern boundary of Canaan. Hamath, Barothoth, Sabrim, which is between the border of Damascus and the border of Hamath, Hazar Hatakon, which is by the coast of Haran. Now, uh, between the parallel ranges of Lebanon is, a, is the Albaca Valley. That's your primary source of heroin that funds the government of Syria these days. But that leading to the entering of Hamath on the Rantas on the Syrian frontier. Barathas is also a city in Syria conquered by David. The word means wells, but in 2 Samuel 8. Hazar Hadakon means the middle village. It's between these. And Haran is a tract in Syria south of Damascus. We're going to be reading all the way to Damascus here shortly. And the border from the sea shall be Hazar Inan, the border of Damascus, and the, and, uh, and the north northward, and the border Hamath, and this is the north side. So Hazar Inan is also on the north of Canaan, meaning the village of the fountains. The Mediterranean border will stretch east from the Mediterranean Sea north of the modern city of Tripoli, which will include what was then the northern border of Syria, roughly 115, 115 miles north of Damascus. I'll show you on this on a map here in a minute, so you don't have to try to sketch it yet. <laughs> so the northbound is from the Great Mediterranean to the Hezlon, that's uh, six miles north of Tripoli, to the entrance of Hamath and the Rontis, that's 150 miles north of Damascus, to Zadad and... and uh, that's just a repeat of what we just read. Okay. And the east side ye shall measure from Haran and from Damascus and from Gilead and from the land of Israel by Jordan from the border unto the east sea, and this is the east side. Notice we're going to be on the west bank of the Jordan, not the east, by the way. Interesting. The eastern border will be the Jordan River and 25 miles southeast of the Dead Sea. Gilead, the Transjordan area to the east of the Jordan, will not be included in Israel's future inheritance. And frankly, that surprised me as I, as I came to grips with that. And the south side southward from Tamar even to the waters of Strife and Kadesh, the river to the Great Sea, that's the Mediterranean. And this is the south side southward. The west side shall also be the Great Sea from the border till a man come over and against Hamath, and that's the west side. So the southern boundary is 50 miles south of Beersheba. Give you a feeling for that. That's down desert way. The country east of Jordan is excluded. So shall you divide this land unto you according to the tribes of Israel. And it shall come to pass that ye shall divide it by lot for an inheritance unto you and to the strangers that sojourn among you, which shall beget children among you. And they shall be unto you as born in the country among the children of Israel. And they shall have inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. So we're going to go through these allocations here shortly. It shall come to pass that in what tribe the stranger sojourneth, there shall ye give him his inheritance, saith the Lord God. Now that's a big surprise. The strangers can also, aliens can also inherit. Now these are the names of the tribes. From the north end to the coast of the way of Hethlon, as one goeth to Hamath, Hazaranan, and uh, Hamath, for these are his sides east and west, a portion for Dan. Now the tribe of Dan is quite an enigma and worth your studying. He is very, very notorious. It's interesting, on the one hand, he's the first one to be listed here, only because they're going from north to south. It's actually the furthest from the temple. So it's not a place of honor. It happens to be named first. Okay. The locations of all 12 tribes will differ from their locations that they had during Joshua's time to the, uh, to the captivities. From Joshua the captivities, they had maps you're probably familiar with. This will be different. That, similar, but different. 
tribe of Dan, he for so long has been basically so, almost a semi-heathen. So he has the least honorable place here at the extreme north. In Judges 18, uh, that whole chapter deals with this. Da remember, Dan had the largest population back in Numbers 1, but he got the smallest allocation, the area west of Benjamin's. And they couldn't cut it. Samson did a lot of colorful pranks, but really didn't accomplish anything. And when Samson dies, they couldn't hold the territory against the Philistines. They looked for some other ground that would be easier to manage. So they end up resettling up at Laish, up in the north. It's interesting that long before all that happens, Moses mentions a prophecy about Dan and says he will leap from Bashan, Bashan being the Golan. And uh, what's bizarre about Moses' prophecy he prophesied that he's going to leap from Bashan. That was before he was even assigned his land, and the assigned his land was west of Jerusalem, not up north. And yet he ends up taking his own initiative to go up north, and yet that's, it, that's embraced by Moses' prophecy that he's going to leave, because he's, he's going to spring from there. And uh, Josephus records the same thing, by the way. The tribe of Dan was lost, if you will, long before the Assyrian invasion. Um, one of the clues here is the Song of Deborah. When Deborah and Barak were fighting Sisera, after they won, Deborah has the Song of Deborah where in, in Judges 5, where she complains about the tribes that didn't help. Asher didn't do anything, and Dan didn't even leave his ships. Well, wait a minute, what's Dan doing with ships? You start connecting the dots here, he moved, he went up north, fellowship with the Phoenicians, learned the seafaring ways, and became very powerful at sea, and ends up populating a major portion of Europe, interestingly enough. By the border of Dan, from the east side unto the west side, a portion for Asher. Asher is also something that didn't help much during the war with Sisera. And by the border of Asher, from the east side even to the west side, a portion for Naphtali. And by the border of Naphtali, from the east side to the west side, a portion for Manasseh. And by the border of Manasseh, from the east side unto the west side, a portion for Ephraim. And by the border of Ephraim, from the east side even to the west side, a portion for Reuben. And by the border of Reuben, from the east side to the west side, a portion for Judah. And by the border of Judah, from the east side to the west side, shall be an offering, which shall be an offer of five and twenty thousand reeds in breadth and in length, as one of the other parts from the east side unto the west side, and the sanctuary shall be in the midst of it. Okay, remember our little diagram of the so-called holy place, holy portion. Going from north to south, it's Dan, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Ephraim, Reuben, and Judah. So we've got seven of the twelves north of the temple. You're with me so far. We're going to talk a little bit about the temple area again. The oblation that she shall offer unto the Lord shall be of five and twenty thousand in length and of ten thousand in breadth. And for them, even for the priests, shall be this holy oblation. Toward the north, five and twenty thousand in length, and toward the west, ten thousand in breadth, and toward the east, ten thousand in breadth, and toward the south, five and twenty thousand in length. And the sanctuary of the Lord shall be in the midst thereof. And shall be for the priests that are sanctified of the sons of Zadok which have kept my charge and went not astray when the children of Israel went astray as the Levites went astray. You may recall how the priesthood was in two families, but one was disenfranchised. Zadok was the preferred one way back in David's time. I should say Solomon's time. And uh, they're still favored here in terms of their responsibilities and so on. And this oblation of the land is offered shall be unto them a thing most holy by the border of the Levites. Over against the border of the priest, the Levite shall have five and twenty thousand in length, ten thousand in breadth. All the length shall be five and twenty thousand, and the breadth ten thousand. And they shall not sell of it, neither exchange or alienate the first fruits of the land, for it is holy unto the Lord. And the five thousand that are left in the breadth over against the five and twenty thousand shall be a profane place for the city, and for the dwelling, and for the suburbs, and the city shall be in the midst thereof. And these shall be the measures thereof, the north side four thousand five hundred, South side, 4,500, and on the east side, 4,500, and on the west side, 4,500. And the suburbs of the city shall be toward the north, 250, toward the south, 250, toward the east, 250, toward the west, 250. Uh, you can get a map of this in a minute, so 
Bear with me. And the residue in length over and against the oblation of the holy portion shall be 10,000 eastward, 10,000 westward, and it shall be over and against the oblation of the holy portion, and the increase thereof shall be for food unto them that serve the city. And they that serve the city shall serve it out of all the tribes of Israel. All the oblation shall be five and twenty thousand by five and twenty thousand. Ye shall offer the holy oblation four square with the possession of the city. And the residue shall be for the prince on the one side, and on the other side the holy oblation and the possession of the city over and against five and twenty thousand of the oblation toward the east border, and westward over against the five and twenty thousand toward the west border, over against the portions for the prince, and it shall be the holy oblation, and the sanctuary of the house shall be in the midst thereof. Are you following all that? You could sketch that, could you? Moreover, from the possession of the Levites and from the possession of the city, being in the midst of that which is in the princes, between the border of Judah and the border of Benjamin, shall be for the prince. Well, here is a sketch. Again, we went through some of this before, but maybe this fills in where we got some of the numbers. And so this is the 25,000 by 25,000 uh, holy district, as some authorities call it. And you have... The uh, living quarters of the sons right, of uh, Zadok right by the temple. The Levites are a little distant to the north. And you have food growing on either side of the city itself, which is Jerusalem. And the prince himself has some substantial lands on both sides of the holy district. So that's the quick snapshot, if you will. Let's get back to the tribes here. And for the rest of the tribes, from the east side to the west side, Benjamin shall have a portion. They were going southward here. And then by the border of Benjamin, from the east side to the west side, Simeon shall have a portion. And by the border of Simeon from the east side to the west side, Issachar shall have a portion. And by the border of Issachar from the east side unto the west side, Zebulun will have a portion. And by the border of Zebulun from the east side to the west side, Gad shall have a portion. And by the border of Gad at the south side of southward, the border shall be even from Tamar to the waters of strife in Kadesh and to the river toward the great sea. This is the land which he shall divide by lot unto the tribes of Israel for inheritance. And these are their portions, saith the Lord God. And these are goings out of the city on the north side, 4,500 measures. Small point here, by the way. Most of us, when we hear it's divided by the lot, assume they're drawing straws. And I think there's a translational confusion here. I think it's, when, it's, when it says by lot, it isn't by gambling. It's being allocated, I think, is what the concept really is. Because it's predetermined here. It's not, it isn't rolling a dice and, ooh, I won a little more than you did, kind of thing. Not that at all. In fact, so we went through last time, Dan, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Ephraim, Reuben, and Judah. And now in the south we have Benjamin, Simeon, Issachar, Zebulun, and Gad. So there you've got the 12 tribes. I want you to notice none of them are lost. Okay? You also notice there's 12 tribes even when you don't count Levi. So you got a baker's dozen because there's 13 tribes. If you want to Count Levi and have 12, you take Ephraim and Manasseh and put them together as Joseph. And Joseph gets a double portion. Interestingly enough, you see. So, anyway, there we are. This is a sketch of what we think we've read and what some authorities feel as they've tried to work this out. For, you know, with uh, Zadad, the northern part of Canaan, working right on, right on down um, to the Wadi of Egypt, if you will, at the south, as they call it. And uh, so you have uh, Dan, Asher, of Naphtali, Manasseh, Ephraim, Reuben, Judah, going from, um, you know, up here, Sidon and Tyre, all the way down to the band that is the pre princess portion and the holy district. And then south of that district, you have Benjamin, Simeon, Issachar, Zebulun, and Gad. So um, it all makes sense. That seems to be it. It's surprising that, oh, and just to give you a little bit another thing here, to amplify the, what, the holy district, if I can call it that, you've got a portion there that's 8.3 miles by 8.3 miles, to give you a rough feeling for that. And uh, you've got the temple in the middle of that, the priests closest to the temple, the Levites who have a, only a supporting role in this situation uh, to the north. You have the city and city land uh, divided up in the south couple of miles on the side. So on the one hand, it's not as big as it first seems, and yet at the same time, it's surprising that it does not include the east bank of the Jordan or any of that. It's, uh, that, that is the, the program. The gates of the city. Now we're talking about the gates of the city shall be after the names of the tribes of Israel. 
Gates of the city we're talking about now. Three gates northward, one gate of Reuben, one gate of Judah, and one gate of Levi. Reuben was the firstborn originally, right? Judah was the royal tribe, and Levi was the tribe of the priesthood. So interestingly enough, the northward uh, gates of the city, which are closest to the temple. See, the temple is to the north. It's not the temple mount that we know today, obviously. Um, in any case, uh, so Reuben and Judah and, and Levi have the favored, those three gates are on the favored side of the city. All three were children of Jacob's first wife, Leah. On the east side, 4,500 on the three gates, and one gate of Joseph, and one gate of Benjamin, and one gate of Dan. The tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh were combined as the tribe of Joseph here for this purpose. Joseph, see, because we had Levi mentioned as a tribe, so now you, that's a tip off. They're going to take Ephraim and Manasseh and call it the tribe of Joseph. Joseph, you got a, you got a baker's dozen. You got 13 tribes from which you make your dozen, so to speak. Joseph and Benjamin were both sons of Rachel. So they're very, very special. Very, very special. Dan was the first son of Rachel's servant, Bilhah, who became Jacob's concubine in Genesis 30. At the south side, 4,500 measures, and the three gates, one gate for Simeon, gate of Issachar, gate of Zebulun. These three were also born to Leah, the first uh, wife of, of uh, Jacob. Since each of these tribes was relocated in the southern portion of the land, the gates faced their inheritances. So from a temple point of view, they're less favorable. But they're f very close to the land that's theirs. So they had, you know, it's... Uh, uh, different aspects. At the west side, 4,500, and their three gates, the gate of Gad, the gate of Asher, and the gate of Naphtali. These three tribes differ, uh, descended from the sons of uh, Jacob's concubine, Gad and Asher from Zilpah, and Naphtali from Bilhah, sons of the concubines. It was around about 18,000 measures. The name of the city from that day shall be the Lord is there. Wow, that's quite a turn. This, in many respects, is the climactic line in the book of Ezekiel. Israel is restored, the temple is restored, and God is dwelling among them. From that day, the name of the city shall be, the Lord is there. That, uh, that's it in Hebrew. Yorevave Shema. Yorevave Shema, or Yahweh, if you will, or however you want to pronounce it. However you want to pronounce the unpronounceable name of God. Okay. Most rabbis just pronounce the letters. Yorevave. Now you compare that verse with the climax in Revelation. Revelation 21. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. Wow. This is a far more intensive thing than simply Matthew 12, 6. That one greater than the temple is here, when Jesus was among them. This is a more bigger crescendo here. The millennium is a story. We, we've been, uh, we've finished uh, the Ezekiel. Let's just wrap it up here a little bit. The millennium is a dividing issue in the church. Nine out of ten church don't believe in it. They think it's an allegory of some kind. Allegories are a license to invent. The millennium was promised to David in 2 Samuel 7, the, the, the unconditional Davidic covenant. God did it under oath in Psalm 89. That means he can't change his mind. It was predicted all through the Psalms and the Prophets, literally dozens of times. It was promised to Mary by Gabriel at the Annunciation, which is also fulfillment of Micah 5.2 and Isaiah 9.6 on a Christmas cards. For unto us a son is born, a child is given. Those are not the same thing, by the way. Child is given as a human. The son is given as God, it's God and divine. And that's why when you look at the constellation Virgo, the brightest star is Spica, which is they now discover a double star. How interesting. We go in, uh, anyway, 
It's reaffirmed to the apostles in Luke 22, among other places. In the Lord's Prayer, we pray, Thy kingdom come. What are we talking about? I'm not talking about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is everywhere. It's His. That's not going to come anywhere. No, it's the kingdom from God, the kingdom from heaven, that's going to be, that's at issue here. It was that kingdom that Satan offered to Christ in Luke 4. And it was his to give at that time. No, thy kingdom come. It, Jesus is going to rule on the planet earth. That's what Psalm 2 is all about. That's what Psalm 110 is all about. He's going to rule with a rod of iron. That becomes an identifier all through the Bible of him. Every knee shall bow, Psalm 2, and, and also Philippians 2 underscores. The millennium is not heaven. It's the more you study the millennium, the more puzzling it becomes. It's not heaven. Newton, it is not the eternal state that follows the millennium. Those are different. It's not the new earth. There's going to be a new heavens and earth later. It's not where righteousness dwells. Not in the sense that that illusion makes place. There will be a limited amount of evil in the millennium. But it will be judged immediately. The creation is going to change. There will be physical changes. All, Zechariah, all through the Old Testament mentions that. The curse apparently in some sense is lifted. Isaiah 11 makes that point. Remember, the lamb's going to lie down with the lion. They do that today. The lamb is inside the lion when they lie down. <laughs> creation is redeemed. There's going to be seven times as much light, apparently. Yeah, compare Genesis 3 with Romans 8, verse 20 to 22, and so on. The earth is full of the knowledge of the Lord. It's not going to be characterized by deceit as our world today is characterized. There may be problems, but it's not going to be of that kind. The earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Isaiah 11 and Habakkuk 2 make that point. And yet it's not eternity yet. There is death and sin. There apparently, most of what we know about the millennium does not come from Revelation 20. It comes from Isaiah 65 and other places. Apparently there's very extended longevity. People speculate maybe it's going to be like the days of early Genesis. Each is going to have land. There's ownership. And it will be fruitful. Some people sense that it may be death for unbelievers only. There's a strange passage in Isaiah 65 verse 17 that people still scratch their head over. Nowhere is there a resurrection of millennial saints. That's puzzling. Because there's a resurrection at the end of the millennium, but that's of the unsaved dead that go to judgment. Strange. The tribulation saints are complete, the complete the first re resurrection back at the beginning of the millennium. That completes the first resurrection. Blessed is he that's in that room. Too bad if you're in the second resurrection, you're, you're, you're part of that other group, and that ain't fun. Some argue that there are no Jewish unbelievers. Apparently all except by the hundredth year it's supplied by that strange verse in Isaiah 65, 20. Good, competent, well-meaning authorities have very, are very puzzled by most of these passages. Very hard to reconcile into some particular point of view. Is death only among the Gentiles? There are people, some good scholars, that hold those views. I'm not sure I do, but I can't rebut them. I can understand why they hold them. But it's not bulletproof, it's complicated. But I want to remind you about, let's, we've talked about the millennium so much. Let's talk about Revelation 20, verse 7, 8, and 9. That wraps it up. This is the ribbon on the whole deal. Revelation, John writes, And when the thousand years are expired, in other words, the millennium is over. Christ's rule is not over. The millennium is over. How long does Christ rule? Forever. I bet you. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his, out of his prison. And he shall go out and deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from the God of heaven and devoured them. Period. End of story. 
Interesting. Because of the illusion to Gog and Magog, many people get confused. They try to shoehorn Ezekiel 38 and 39 into the end of the millennium. Doesn't work. The context is different. The players are different. The results are different. So why is it illusion here? One conjecture is that Gog and Magog by then become an idiom. Become an idiom. It's sort of like saying, like Sodom and Gomorrah. You don't mean literally Sodom and Gomorrah, but like that. It was one of those kinds of events. That's one possibility. The fact that Magog is around is no surprise. It is a people. Gog is a demon title, as we learned back then. So it could be, it could be very literally true, and yet not necessarily limited to them. They may be there idiomatic. For example, all through the Old Testament it speaks of Ephraim when it really means the northern kingdom. Ephraim was the dominant tribe of the group up there, and so often the word Ephraim is used as a synecdoche. A synecdoche is when you use a specific for the general, or the general for the specific. We do that all the time. Hey man, I sure like those wheels, meaning his car, right? Boy, she sets a beautiful table. You don't mean just the table, you mean the whole household furnishings. You know what I'm saying? In other words, we use synecdoches all the time, where we take a specific but mean it connotatively, okay? And vice versa, and vice versa. And so it could be, a, in that sense, a synecdoche, but we'll see. It certainly, don't try to squeeze Ezekiel 38 and 39 into the end of the millennium. It ain't going to work, for a lot of reasons. Okay. Okay, for the next session, we have a supplemental addendum called The Origin of Evil that's appended to this series. Part one of a two-part series will talk in detail about the gap theory, about Satan's origin, agenda, and destiny. We touched upon that. We summarized it when we were in Ezekiel 28, but we've had so much comment about it that I, I, we thought it would be smart. Just let's focus on that and really nail it. Because there's two problems with the gap theory. There are those that deny it and those that misapply it. And we'll try to do neither between those two. And then part two of that is going to focus on our predicament as a result of all of this and what our resources are. And it will, of course, include but not be limited to the armor of God and a review of that. So it's an appendage to this study of Ezekiel. God bless you guys.